guys that are brave enough to sit on the front row and I've noticed there are not any ladies to, so I don't know if it's higher intelligence or, or what but I think it might be higher intelligence <laughs> but guys I appreciate you sitting on the front row thank you question for you this morning have you ever felt unpopular Ever been a moment? Yes, I'm getting some nods. Some of you are really identifying right now. Some of you are like, Man, I've always been the most popular person. <laughs> Another question. Have you ever had to take a stand when no one else did? That can be a lonely feeling, isn't it? Well, the piece of clothing that we're talking about this morning is definitely something that is not popular. It's not popular. Culture says it's outdated. 
and overrated and definitely not fashionable. So as we're thinking about these things that, that God calls us to clothe ourselves with, these characteristics that He wants us to wear in our lives to demonstrate, some of them are not popular. In fact, the one we're going to talk about this morning is not popular. But Jesus is our example. And he modeled what it looks like to wear this piece of clothing. He showed us how to live. Aren't you thankful for that? I am so thankful that, that Jesus did not just come to die for us, although that was why he came. But while he was here to do that for us, he showed us how to live. He is our perfect example. And he wants us to imitate him and to be like him. So while this next piece of clothing is not popular... It's essential. So let's just refresh ourselves this morning. Colossians 3.12 Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So of course this morning we're talking about humility. Humility is not popular, is it? I mean, humility is not a virtue that our culture says that you should seek after. Humility is not something that our culture holds up. And in the time where Paul wrote this letter, it also was not popular to be humble. It was not culturally relevant to be humble. Humility is not popular, but it's essential. And so this morning we're going to look at what it means to be humble. So just to get our, our brains moving, a definition of, of humility that comes from the dictionary is a modest or low view of one's own importance. So that's sort of our, our, our beginning definition. Humility is a modest or low view of one's own importance. So the idea of humility is, is figuring out of what order you are in relation to others and to God. So I've sort of revamped that definition just a little bit. And I think a better definition is this. Humility is considering God and others as being more important than yourself. Humility is considering God and others as being more important than yourself. And that's not a popular idea. Our culture doesn't promote it. In fact, we are bombarded with just the opposite. We are bombarded in culture with the idea that life is about you. And life is to be lived for you. And so seek whatever makes you happy. Do what's most important to you. Live for you. That is the notion of our culture. And there's something within us, in our sinfulness, that we all have this tendency, this bent towards pride. Towards thinking of ourselves as more important than others. To looking out for our own interests above the interests of others. Our happiness, our desires, our way. Have you ever wanted to get your way? All right, just think back to your time. Is there ever a time that, that you wanted to get your way? Anybody have any memories about times like that? All right, that means you're human. That's good. Did you ever demand that you get your own way? Did you ever run someone over to get your own way? I don't mean literally now. <laughs> I hope not literally. Sort of gone with the figurative language there. But we've all been there because we all have a bent towards pride. And pride is thinking too much of yourself and too little of God. Ultimately, that's the essence of pride. Thinking too much of yourself and too little of God. And Paul writes to the church and he says, You are to clothe yourselves with humility. Why? Because God hates pride. God hates pride. Pride is an offense to God. It pushes God away. And when our lives are clothed with pride, we are not reflecting Jesus to the world. And so we're going to look at what it means to clothe ourselves with humility this morning. And again, we're going to look at Jesus as our example. And Jesus is the perfect example of what humility looks like. Because if there was anyone who had a right to be self-centered and self-focused, it was Jesus. Read Colossians chapter 1 later on today. Jesus is the center of this universe. He's the sustainer of the universe. And so if anyone had a right to be self-centered and self-focused, it was Jesus because he is the center. But Jesus modeled what humility looks like. Philippians chapter 2, so we're going to spend a little time this morning. So if you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 2. And I want us to begin uh, in verse 5 and we'll work through verse 8. And then in a little bit we're going to go back to the beginning of the chapter. But let's look first at Philippians chapter 2 and, and beginning in verse 5. Paul says this, he says, Have this mind among yourselves. Literally he's saying, think this way, which is yours in Christ. So he says, you, you have 
a, a mentality or a thought process which Christ has given you, who, though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So in verse 5, as he begins this section, he challenges his readers to, to think differently. Because here's the thing, how we think determines how we behave. How you think determines how you behave. If your thinking is wrong, your behaving will be wrong. And so when it comes to clothing ourselves with humility, it begins with how we think. And Jesus, being God, the sustainer, the creator of the universe, it says he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. What does that mean? These, this line has been misinterpreted and misused in many different contexts, but here's what it means literally. It means that he did not demand or cling to his rights as God. He did not demand or cling to his rights as God. Literally, he laid aside his rights. He laid aside his rights. That is the essence of humility. I like how it's stated in the message. Now, the message is just a, it's a paraphrase of Scripture. It's not a translation. It's not something we use for, for deep study. It's just one person saying, here's the Bible in my own thoughts or words. But I like what he says here. He, he translates it like this. He says, he had equal status with God, Jesus did, but he didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. And you really think that captures some of the essence of what Paul's saying here. He did not cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Look at what it says in verse 7. He emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself. He took on the role of a servant. Look at, look at what it says there. He made himself nothing. Literally, he emptied himself and he took on the form, the role of a servant. And was born in the likeness of men. He doesn't cling to his advantages or his status as God. He, he humbles himself. He humbled himself all the way to the point of being born in a manger, in a barn, in a stable. That's a hu humble way to enter the world. He limited himself to humanity. And he humbled himself all the way down to the greatest act of injustice that's ever occurred. And that's the cross. I mean, think about it. Nothing was more unjust than the cross and the circumstances that led up to the cross. He was betrayed by Judas. That was unjust. He, the illegal trials at night. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was spit on and slapped and nailed to a cross. And he was mocked as he hung in shame. And yet he humbly endured all of this. How did he do it? And how do you, how do you humble yourself to those sort of circumstances if you're the God of the universe. And here's, here's, here's what he did. He entrusted his life to the Father. See, the secret to humility is that not only did he have the right view of himself, but he entrusted his life to the Father. And he says we are to have the same mind. If we're going to clothe ourselves with humility, if you and I are going to wear humility as we're told to do, and remember, we're told to do this. Why? Because we are chosen, we are holy, we're set apart, and we are loved. And so as those who are chosen and holy and loved, he says, clothe yourselves with humility, and it begins by having the same mind. And you know, we get so caught up in our rights sometimes, don't we? And, and thankfully, we live in a country where we have rights, and they have been blessings to us and to our country. But as followers of Christ, sometimes we get hung up on our rights, don't we? Have you ever thought you had the right to something? That you deserve something? Anybody? We get hung up on our rights sometimes. We cling to them. We demand them. We strive. We want our own way. And that's pride. And it's an offense to God. And it pushes God out of our lives. Literally, the Bible says that God stiff arms the proud. And He holds them at a distance. And when we are filled with pride, it brings conflict into our lives, into our relationships. It brings conflict into His church. And Paul is dealing with that as he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. 
He is dealing with the fact that there's conflict in the church. And he wants them to come to a place where there's unity in the church. In fact, if you were to read chapter 4, Paul actually calls out this conflict by name. Chapter 4, he mentions two ladies that are having a conflict in the church. And he says, I urge you to have the same mind and to agree together. Can you imagine, just let's use our imaginations a little bit this morning, warm your brain up for the activities of the day. Can you imagine when they, they, they receive this letter from Paul, right? And they're going to, you know, they announce it, they put it on Facebook, they, they send the Twitter messages out. Hey, don't miss this Sunday. Paul wrote us a letter and we're going to be reading it in the service. Don't, and we're going to have potluck afterwards. It's going to be wonderful, right? And so, can you, you know, imagine as they're sort of you know, reading this letter in, in, in the service in the church, and Paul's reading, he's writing from prison to us, we want to hear what he has to say, and then they get to chapter 4, and he calls these two ladies out by name. <laughs> God, we've got a little tense in there. I bet they were sliding a little further down in their seats. Conflict occurs when we selfishly seek our own way. And Jesus showed us a different way to live, a better way to live. Look back at at the first verses in this chapter, verses 1 through 4. Paul says if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not out only for his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says that if there's any encouragement in Christ, what does that mean? It literally means to come alongside and help. He says if Christ has come alongside of you and helped you, he says if you've had any comfort from love, it means tender counsel. He says if you've experienced Jesus, if there's participation in the Spirit, it means fellowship. All right? And fellowship does not mean fried chicken dinner. All right? You know that, right? We, we talk about our fellowship. What do you do in the fellowship hall? You eat, right? But fellowship literally means shared life. And so we have fellowship with God. We have shared life with God and we have fellowship with one another. We have shared life. And he says if there's any, any fellowship, participation in the Spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy, if you've experienced the compassion of Christ, is what he's saying. And, and he uses this word, so if... And the implication there is, you have experienced this. And because you've experienced this, Paul says, help me, help me be happy. <laughs> right? He says, help me to complete my joy. I, I want to be joyful about you and your situation. So he says, help me out here. And you see, Paul longed for what Jesus longed for. Jesus was passionately desiring that his church would be unified. Read John chapter 17. The night before Jesus goes to the cross, he prays for unity among his people. That, and as Paul talks about here, that we would have the same mind and the same love. Being in full accord. Literally, it means to be one souled. One purpose, one direction. How do we achieve that? How do we get one purpose and one direction in the body of Christ? Humility. Humility. Look at verse 3. Do nothing... Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count. And it's literally like an accounting term there. It says, it, when you do the math, count others more significant than yourselves. What would happen if we chose to do that? What would happen in our lives, in our churches, in our families, in our communities, if we chose to count others as more significant than ourselves? See, pride pushes for its own way. But we're not called to live that way. We're not called to live that way. He says, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Don't just think about what you want. Think about what others want. And I know when we get to that point, we start thinking, but wait, that means I might not get my way, right? Right? And sometimes getting our way seems really important to us, doesn't it? But you know what? It's okay if you don't always get your way. It is okay if you don't get your way. Think about it. Jesus had equal status with God. 
but he did not think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. You have been called by God to know him. The invitation of salvation is not just an invitation to go to heaven. It's an invitation to know God and to experience a living relationship with him. And as his child, he wants the very best for you. He really does. And again, when we talk about these things that we're to clothe ourselves with, these aren't coming out of a list of rules. Here's what you have to do. Here's what you have to do to earn my love or my approval. He already loves you with an affection and a love that you don't even begin to understand. And there's nothing you can do to change the way that he feels about you. Do you know that? If you're God's child, there is nothing you can do to change the way he feels about you. He loves you with an un- He loved you before you loved him. He loved you while you were still a sinner. He loved you and he gave his son up for you. You're an object of his love and affection. And based on having experienced that love, he says, trust me that I know the best way for you to live. You're not earning his love. You're living in his love. So don't fight him. Don't have a clothing battle with your Heavenly Father. Because I think that's what happens a lot of times. We, we have this clothing battle. And God says, I want you to wear these things. And we're like, I don't want to wear that right now. I'm going to ask you, are you clinging to the advantages of your status? Important question for you to, to wrestle with. Because as you move out and in through life, you're going to have opportunities to be in, in positions of influence. You're going to be leaders. You're going to have opportunity to think that it's all about you. And God says, never ever get to that place where you think it's about you. No matter what position God puts you in, He calls you to clothe yourself with humility, to be a servant, to be willing to serve others. Jesus is our example. The world pushes us towards pride and towards selfishness. It holds pride up as a virtue, really, doesn't it? And Jesus says, I have an upside down way for you to live. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, reminds us this. It says, do not what? Be conformed to this, to the pattern of this world. See, this world has a pattern. This world has an example for you to follow. And in Christ, God says, I have a different way for you to live. A different pattern to follow. An upside down pattern to follow. And then I love the next uh, verse I want us to look at. Later on in this chapter, it's a great challenge for us. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Paul says, love one another with brotherly affection. Love one another with brotherly affection. And then he gives us a challenge. So if you're competitive, anybody competitive? All right, I'm not competitive, but <laughs> just want to see if you're awake. I might be a little bit competitive. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. So if you're competitive, this verse is great because he says, here's the goal. Outdo one another in showing honor. What would happen if we really lived that way? If we really made it our goal to say, today I'm going to try to outdo everyone else in being humble and showing honor and putting others ahead of myself. You can almost become prideful about your humility. Humility is one of those things where if you're really aware of it, you're probably not. So I'm going to challenge you to think about that. How can we do that? How can we show honor to each other? So I want you to think about that. Here, here at camp, how can we show humility towards one another? At home. Again, one of the hardest places to live these things out is at home. How can you show honor at home? In your church, in your community, wherever you are. Our culture pushes us towards self-centeredness and towards pride. But God calls you to live differently. He calls you to clothe yourselves with humility. Last verse I want us to look at. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And again, literally, where it says he opposes the proud, it's that if you're a football fan, right, it's literally the idea of being stiff-armed holding you off. It says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. Jesus is our example. 
If anyone had the right to be self-centered, if anyone had the right to be self-focused, it was Jesus. But he was completely unselfish, completely unfocused on his own self. And he calls us to follow his example, to have the same mind. So I want to challenge you this morning to ask God to allow your mind to be renewed and to not conform yourself to the pattern of this world, but to say, say, God, I, I want to have the same mindset that Jesus had, so help me to have that mindset. Help me to think about myself as not being the most important person in the world. We're all born that way, right? Once you have children, you realize they think they're the center of the universe, and you have to help them understand that they are not the center of the universe. That life doesn't, you know, the axis of the universe does not go right through you, right? But sometimes we live that way. We think the center of the universe must be right here where I am at this moment. And it's not true. Jesus is the center. And he calls you to follow his example. Would you bow your heads this morning? Just, just to have a, a few quiet moments of, of reflection. Because I, I think it's really important that, that before we, uh, when we hear God's word, and that we take a few moments to just be still and to be quiet and to think about how it is that he's wanting us to respond. Is there something in your life that the Spirit might be convicting you about right now? And if there is, confess that. Maybe, maybe you realize, hey, in an area of my life, I've been sort of prideful. And, and, and I've made life more about me than I should be making it. And, and if that's the case, here's what you need to do. Just confess it. Just tell it to God. He already knows. And he's willing and ready and waiting to forgive you. He wants to help you make an adjustment in the direction of your life. And for all of us, for all of us, we need to remember that this is a daily necessity. Because all of us have a bent towards pride. Some more than others, but we all have a bent towards pride. And without the work of the Spirit in our life, we will by nature become self-centered and self-focused. And so that's why we have to consciously clothe ourselves with humility. And to remember Jesus and to remember his example. He emptied himself. He didn't cling to his rights. He didn't cling to his status. But instead he served everyone and anyone. Don't cling to your rights and don't cling to your status. Don't think that you're important because of your title or your position. Have the mindset of Jesus. Just take a few moments to, to ask the Holy Spirit to to show you what he wants you to do to respond to his word. Father, we, we come before you this morning. And we just thank you so much that you gave Jesus to us as an offering for our sin. Father, when we could not come to you, you came to us. And Father, I thank you that Jesus took on the form of a servant. And he served us by meeting our greatest need. By dying in our place. By absorbing your wrath for our sin. And Father, I pray that this morning that we would see Jesus as our example. That we would see his humility. And Father, I pray that we would choose today to clothe ourselves with that humi humility. And Father, I pray that you'd protect our minds from thinking incorrectly. Protect our minds from adopting the, the values of our culture instead of the values of your kingdom. And Father, I pray that you'd change our mindset and that you'd give us a true kingdom, kingdom mindset. And that we would see ourselves as servants. No matter what position you call us to, no matter what privilege you give us in serving, Father, I pray that we would never ever think that it's about us and that we would never think that we're more important than others. Father, help us today to show humility to each other. Help us to outdo one another in showing honor. And may you be glorified in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
be like Jesus today and let's do humble. Okay. Mr. Raleigh, do we have anything this morning?